commander in chief, the, the president of the United States, the extraordinary president of the United States, Joe Biden. We've invested billions to enhance our power grid, expand energy shortages. You got, I, former president, didn't want to go and be up there. I should probably shouldn't even say it. Anyway, I've been all over the world with you. I've been in and out of battle anyway. Jim Doyle. He's yeah. been Blair Blum since I ended the pandemic. But when I was a senator, there, was, uh, there were always congestion on the highways. There's no congestion anymore. Did you know how badly it was going? Yeah, look. I'm the guy that put NATO together. I'm the guy that shut Putin down. We invented the chip, a little chip, a computer chip. How many, how many people do you get and draw crowds like I drew today? You find many more enthusiastic than today? Huh? I mean, I, I don't think you want to play the crowd game. Donald Trump can draw big crowds. There's no question about that. Do you dispute that there have been more lapses, especially in the last several months? Can I run the 110 flat? No, but I'm still in good shape. Was this a bad episode or the sign of a more serious condition? It's a bad episode. Uh. The CEO has a succession plan. Well, by the way, you do have a succession plan. But what do I need a succession plan for? Welcome back to another Resident and Chief Highlights, where we play highlights, aka lowlights, of Joe Biden from the past week. A couple of interesting points I want to make note of before we play these highlights. The first thing is what you see on your screen is apparently what staffers give Biden so that he knows how to enter or exit a room which is really not all that surprising at this point, but it is pretty crazy that he is that senile. In a normal American family, what the Bidens are doing to Joe would be considered elder abuse, but instead, according to media reports, Joe Biden is lashing out at anyone who says that Joe needs to drop out. More Martha Raddatz, the president is talking to a lot of people, but he appears to be listening to a very tight circle. A, a very tight circle, and administration officials I have spoken to said that very tight inner circle is telling them he can win, that he needs to keep going. This, of course, includes his wife, Jill, who they said uh, is lashing out at those who want him to get out of the race. In addition to that, things are so bad that Fox News could not find anyone from the campaign or the administration to come on their Sunday show to defend Biden. Now, before we get to our guests, I want you, the viewers at home, to know something. Our team has spent days reaching out to dozens of lawmakers and Biden advocates and allies. We've had numerous interactions with the Biden-Harris campaign. But not a single potential guest was either able or willing to join us on today's show to defend the president and his decision to stay on the ticket. So we will be having a conversation without that voice, which we have been working around the clock to avoid. Now, as far as the resident and chief highlights from the past week, they include slurring and the typical senile behavior from Biden. He attended church and told his favorite lie, which is that he grew up in the black church and he called black church home, as well as again claiming that he was a leader in the civil rights movement, which is completely made up. Some of the other more blatant lies included, he said that he ended the pandemic, he shut Putin down, and that he created NATO. He also said that we as in the administration invented computer chips, and he tried to claim that he has large crowd sizes, which even George Stephanopoulos had to come in and say, Donald Trump's crowds are much bigger, I'm not really sure what you're talking about. Lastly, if you're someone who hopes he was going to drop out, he has said pretty definitively that he will not be dropping out, although that could change very quickly if the party decides otherwise. With that said, enjoy the highlights of your senile puppet president. So folks know these resources are available to them and anyone who needs them. You got, I was tell, telling the group who briefed me earlier, my brother has an expression, you got to know how to know. Later this summer, my administration will convene the first ever White House Summer on Extreme Heat, bringing together state, local, tribal, and territorial leaders and international partners who are protecting communities and workers from extreme weather every single solitary day. And when finalized, we'll establish the nation's first ever federal safety standard for excessive heat in the workplace. This includes things like developing response plans to heat illness, training employees and supervisors, implementing re re rest breaks, access to shade and water. You'd think we'd have to tell people access to shade and water. But it, I mean, gradually easing new employees into heat environments. Across the country, workers suffer heat stroke or even die just doing their jobs. Look, extreme weather events drive home a point that I've been saying for so long. 
Ignoring climate change is deadly and dangerous and irresponsible. These climate-fueled extreme weather events don't just affect people's lives. They also cost money, they hurt the economy, and they have a significant negative psychological effect on people. Are you confident you're ruling that out? Are you confident you can serve another four years? I'm positive. You always talk to young people. You're so committed to talk to young people. Why not let someone younger take the country forward? Well, by the way, you do have succession plans. But what do I need a succession plan for? Do you value the norms of the officials in your poll? Former president coming I hope he'll debate me. I, 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 I wouldn't be surprised and if he's in. Will you commit to debating? I'm committing now, absolutely, whether he's in or not. You know, I was in that World War One cemetery at, in France, and. Uh, the one that my one of our colleagues, the former president, didn't want to go and be up there. I probably shouldn't even say it. Anyway, <laughs> we got to just remember who the hell we are. We're the United States of America. Yeah. And by the way, I've been all over the world with you. I've been in and out of battle. Anyway. Yeah. How's everybody doing? Welcome to the White House. <laughs> On the 4th of July. Is he going to use it? Yeah. Okay, and hold the main stage. All right, sir, here you go. Oh, sorry. You got me, man. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. All right. <laughs> All right, I'll come back out when they let them open the gate, okay? Thank you, thank you, thank you. One last thing. You know, I used to think when I was a senator, there, was, there were always congestion on the highways. There's no congestion anymore. No, regarding the highway, there's no congestion. And so what, the way they get me to stop talking, they'll say, we just shut down all the roads, Mr. President. You're going to lose all the votes if you don't get in. But anyway, I'll be back out. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I love you. Thank you. Let's start with the debate. Uh, you and your team said have said you had a bad night, uh, but your but your friend Nancy Pelosi actually framed the question that I think is on the minds of millions of Americans: Was this a bad episode, or the sign of a more serious condition? It's a bad episode. Uh, no indication of any serious condition. I was exhausted. I didn't listen to my instincts in terms of preparing, and I had a bad night. You know, you say you were exhausted, and, and I know you've said that before as well, but you came, and you did have a tough month, but you came home from Europe about 11 or 12 days before the debate, spent six days in Camp David. Why wasn't that enough rest time, enough recovery time? Because I was sick. I was feeling terrible. Matter of fact, the docs with me, I asked them if they did a COVID test because they were trying to figure out what was wrong. They did a test to see whether or not I had uh, some infection, you know, a virus. I didn't. He just had a really bad cold. So you spoke with your doctor after the debate. What did he say? He said, he just looked at me. He said, you're exhausted. I said, look, I have medical doctors travel me everywhere. Every president does, as you know. Medical doctors, some of the best in the world, travel me everywhere I go. I have an ongoing assessment of what I'm doing. They don't hesitate to tell me if they think there's something wrong. Do you dispute? That there have been more lapses, especially in the last several months. Can I run the 110 flat? No, but I'm still in good shape. Are you more frail? No. I know you Come spoke. Keep my schedule. <laughs> did you ever watch the debate afterwards? I don't think I did. No. Well, what I'm trying, what I want to get at is, what were you experiencing as you were going through the debate? Did you know how badly it was going? Yeah. Look. The whole way I prepared, nobody's fault of mine. Nobody's fault of mine. I, uh, I prepared what I usually would do, sitting down, as I did come back with foreign leaders or the National Security Council, 
for explicit detail. And I realized about partway through that, you know, although I get quoted, the New York Times had me down at 10 points before the debate, nine now or whatever the hell it is. The fact of the matter is that what I looked at is that he also lied 28 times. I couldn't, I mean, the way the debate ran, not my fault, no one else's fault, no one else's fault. But it seemed like you were having trouble from the first question in, even before he spoke. Well, I just had a bad night. Elections are about the future, not the past. They're about tomorrow, not yesterday. And the question on so many people's minds right now is, can you serve effectively for the next four years? George, I'm the guy that put NATO together, the future. No one thought I could expand it. I'm the guy that shut Putin down. No one thought it could happen. I'm the guy that put together the South Pacific initiative with AUKUS. I'm the guy that got 50 nations, out, not only in Europe, outside of Europe as well, to help Ukraine. I'm the guy that got Japanese to expand their budget. I'm the, so, I mean, these, and for example, when I decided we used to have 40% of the computer chip, and we invented the chip, the little chip, the computer chip. It's been a two-man race for several months. Inflation has come down. In those last few months, he's become a convicted felon. Yet you're still falling further behind. You guys keep saying that. George, do you, look, you know polling better than anybody. Do you think polling data is accurate as it used to be? I don't think so, but I think when you look at all of the polling data right now, it shows that he's certainly ahead in the popular vote, probably even more ahead in the battleground states. And one of the other key factors there is it shows that in many of the battleground states, the Democrats who are running for Senate in the House are doing better than you are. Well, that's not unusual in some states. I carried an awful lot of Democrats last time I ran in 2020. Look, I remember them telling me the same thing in 2020. I can't win. The poll show, I can't win. Remember 2024, 2020, the red wave was coming. Before the vote, I said, that's not going to happen. We're going to win. We did better in an off year than almost any incumbent president ever has done. Well, that is true. But 2020 was a close race. And your approval rating has dropped significantly since then. I think the last poll I saw was at about 36 percent. The oh, number of Americans right. who think you're too old to serve has doubled since 2020. Wouldn't a clear-eyed political calculus tell you that it's going to be much tougher to win in 2024? Not when you're running against a pathological liar. Not when he hadn't been challenged in a way that he's about to be challenged. Not when people... You've had months lie. to challenge him. Oh, I sure had months, but I was also doing a hell of a lot of other things, like wars around the world, like keeping NATO together. Their concerns about your age and your health are growing, so that's why I'm asking, could, to reassure them, would you be willing to have the independent medical evaluation? Watch me between... There's a lot of time left in this campaign. It's over 125 days. So don't the answer, decision. the right answer right now is no. You you don't want to do that right no, now. I've already done it. I know you said you have an ongoing assessment. Have you had a full neurological and cognitive evaluation? I've have, I get a full neurological test every day with me, and I've had a full physical. I had, you know, I mean, I I've been a Walter Reed for my physicals. I mean, uh, yes. What's your plan to turn the campaign around? You saw it today. How many, how many people do you get draw crowds like I drew today? Do you find me more enthusiastic than today? Huh? I mean, I, I don't think you want to play the crowd game. Donald Trump can draw big crowds. There's no question about that. He can draw a big crowd, but what does he say? Who does he have? I'm the guy supposedly in trouble. Now he's announced he wants another $5 billion, trillion, trillion, not billion, $5 trillion tax cut. You've got a former governor, Jim Doyle, or, or yeah. Madison Road, mayor, mayor of this city. But I, I tell you what, once one, after our, I, I went to a local parade, a little parade uh, in a little place called Hocas in Delaware, a little right down the Pennsylvania border after our son had passed, and I was sitting there at home thinking he was his favorite parade, so I decided just to go into it. And I was walking along in this small community, and three guys, four guys about your size came running up to me. I thought the Secret Service was going to kill them. Then they came running up. Swear to God, true story. He said, Joe, what's all this damn stuff about Pennsylvania? You're from Delaware. 
They're from Delaware. Yeah, but it never gets, it never leaves you. We're the most powerful country in the world. We have the best economy in the world, but now we got to make sure that we start taking care of the families like Jill and I grew up. Folks, there's a lot of people still struggling because since, the, since we ended the pandemic, well, I'll be very blunt, since I ended the pandemic, he didn't. <laughs> Corporate profits have doubled, doubled. And we got to do something about it. With your help, I know we have your help. With my help, we're helping us working together. We're going to get a hell of a lot done for the American people. And we're going to make sure these things are. So anyway, I guess if I stand here long enough, all those folks in the back are going to die of sunstroke. But look, uh, even when I was running for Senate, and each time I ran, quite frankly, not a joke, Philadelphia in particular got me across the line. <laughs> No, I'm not joking. Organ or, or, no, I mean, I mean it seriously. Organization, organizationally and in terms of fundraising, the whole deal. But look, here's the deal. This election is going to be about block and tackling. Simple, basic politics. Simple. It's going to be a matter of how many <laughs> signs we get out, how many doors we knock on, how many calls we make, and how many requests we answer. We've been drawing crowds that have been really big crowds ever since the debate, not joking, even that night in the debate, we had great crowds afterwards. And so things are moving. They're moving hard. But I'm not able to do what I used to do. I'd be riding down the street in the, in the, in the vehicle before and see a bunch of kids in the schoolyard waving. I'd stop and get out. Realistically, I can't do that anymore. It's, it's just too dangerous what's going on out there. By the way, I'm proud to be, as I said, the first vice president, first black woman, mm -hmm. served with a black president. Mm -hmm. I'm proud of the, you know, all the first black woman in the Supreme Court. There's just so much that we can do because together, we, there's nothing. Look, this is the United States of America. I don't know why it is that you want to make an issue of the president and his condition with stammering and not being able at certain times to bring forth words while another person lies fluently and you never challenge his lies. America, land that I love. I got my start in public life, never intending to run for office as a public defender in the civil rights movement. And uh, I was no great shakes, but I worked hard in Delaware. And uh, I used to go to 730 Mass in my church. And then I would show up at Reverend Beeman's, now Bishop Beeman, uh, church, uh, AME Church in Wilmington, get ready to go out and make the plans for what we're going to do to change the situation. So uh, it really is good to be home. And I want to thank, uh, thank you uh, for, uh, you know, I said, Bishop, it's good to be home. Please sit down. Let us stand together. Oh, at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burdens of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy. Oh, <laughs> 
me this far to leave me. I'm sad for anybody who's ever been discouraged. I don't feel no waste time. Debate the other night. Oh, oh, fantastic. Amazing. Get all broken down pile of crap. <laughs> yeah.